Millions of mystery readers love mystery bookstores, and Carolyn G. Hart has given them and the bookstore owners someone to cheer for, Annie Lawrence, whose own store is the base for exciting and intellectually stimulating cases in such books as A Little Class on Murder, Something Wicked, and Death on Demand. Miss Hart lives in Oklahoma City. Her Good Name by Carolyn G. Hart Annie Lawrence Darling willed the telephone to ring, but the undistinguished garden-variety black desk telephone remained mute. Damn it, Max could at least call. The more she thought about it, the more she wished that she had gone. Of course, it was undeniably true that Ingrid wasn't available to mind the bookstore, but it wouldn't have been a disaster for a few days in November. She didn't let herself dwell on the fact that Saturday had been her best fall day ever. She'd sold cartons of the latest by Leah Matera and Sarah Peretsky. But there was Max, off to Patagonia and adventure. And here she was, stuck in her closed bookstore on a rainy Sunday afternoon with nothing to do but unpack books and wonder if Max had managed to spring Laurel. Even Laurel should have known better than to take up a collection for Amnesty International in the main hall of the Justice Ministry in Buenos Aires. A tiny worm of worry wriggled in Annie's mind. She knew, of course, that her husband was absolutely capable, totally in command, unflappable, imperturbable. Annie snapped the book shut and bounced to her feet. But, oh, sweet Jesus, who knew what kind of a mess Laurel had... The phone rang. Annie leaped across the coffee area and grabbed up the extension behind the coffee bar. She didn't bother saying death on demand. The finest mystery store on the loveliest resort island off the coast of South Carolina wasn't open. Hello? She tried not to sound concerned, but maybe if she caught a jet tonight... Maxwell, darling! The tone was peremptory cut through to the bone direct. Annie's shoulders tensed. She immediately recognized the dry, crackly voice that rustled like old paper. What did Chastain, South Carolina's most aristocratic, imperious, absolutely impossible old hag want with Annie's husband? Miss Dora, how are you? Annie could remember her manners, even if some others could not. Annie could imagine the flicker of irritation in Miss Dora's reptilian black eyes. No time to waste. Get him to the phone. I wish I could, Annie snapped. Where is he? Patagonia. A thoughtful pause on the other end, then a sniff. Laurel, no doubt. The old lady's voice rasped like a rattlesnake slithering across sand as she disgustedly pronounced the name mother. Of course, Annie groused. And I darn well should have gone. He might need me. You know how dangerous it is in Argentina. A lengthening pause, freighted with emanations of chagrin, malevolence, and rapid thought. Well, I've no choice. You'll have to do. Meet me at 103 Bay Street at 4 o'clock. Annie's eyes narrowed with fury. Miss Dora was obviously the same old hag she'd always been. And just who the hell did she think she was, ordering Annie to... A matter of honor! The phone banged into the receiver. Annie stalked down the storm-dark street, the November rain spattering against her yellow slicker. Clumps of sodden leaves squished underfoot. The semi-tropical Carolina low country was not completely immune to winter, and days such as this presaged January and February. Annie felt another quiver of outrage. Why had she succumbed to the old bat? Why was she even now pushing from the gate and starting down the oyster shell path to 103 Bay Street? The aged, sandpapery voice sounded again in her mind. A matter of honor. The sign to the right of the front door hung unevenly, one screw yielding to time and weather. An amateur had painted the outstretched, cupped hands, the thumbs over-large, the palms lumpy. The legend was faded, but decipherable. Helping hands. Annie was almost to the steps of the white frame cottage when she saw Miss Dora standing regally beneath the low-spreading limbs of an ancient live oak. Annie was accustomed to the gnome-like old lady's eccentric dress, last-century bombazine dresses and hats scarlet would have adored, 
But even Annie was impressed by the full gray cloak, the wide-brimmed crimson hat protecting shaggy silver hair, and the ivory walking stick planted firmly in front of high-topped black leather shoes. A welcoming smile tugged at Annie's lips, then slid to oblivion as Miss Dora scowled and thumped the stick. You're late. The Carolons play at four o'clock. Carolons? A vexed hiss. Come, come, we'll go inside. Wanted you to hear the Carolons. It's too neat, you know. The shot at precisely four o'clock. No, it must have been then. Otherwise, somebody would have heard. Thumping stiffly to the door, Miss Dora scrabbled in her oversized crocheted receptacle. No one's taken Constance's character into account, not even her own brother. Blackening her name. A damnable lie. She jammed a black iron key into the lock. As the door swung in, Miss Dora led the way, a tiny, limping figure. She clicked on the hall light, then regarded Annie with an obvious lack of enthusiasm. Would do it myself, she muttered obscurely. But sciatica, with the rain in November. The parchment face, wrinkled with age, also held lines of pain. Annie almost felt sorry for her. Almost. The stick swished through the air. A dependency, of course. Small, cramped, cold floors in the winter... Constance had no use for her own creature comforts. Never gave them a thought. Sixty years she took care of the poor and the helpless here in Chestain. Everybody welcome here. The rasp muted to a whisper. And may her murderer burn in hell. The hair prickled on the back of Annie's neck. She looked around the dimly lit linoleum floored hallway. Worn straight chairs lined both sides of the hall. Near the door turned sideways to allow passageway sat a yellow pine desk. The stick pointed at the desk. Manned by volunteers, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. every day but Sunday. Emma Louise ran it yesterday. You will talk to her. The calm assumption irritated Annie. Look, Miss Dora, you're taking a lot for granted. I only came over here because you hung up before I could say no. Now, I've got things on my mind. Murder? Annie fervently hoped not. Surely Max and Laura were safe. Max had promised to be careful. He was going to hire a mercenary, fly into the secret airstrip, hijack Laurel from her captors. A pot full of money always worked wonders, whatever the political persuasion. And fly right back out. Oh, hell, she should have gone. What if he needed her? Oh, who knows, Annie moaned. Don't be a weak sister, the old lady scolded. Asinine to fret. He'll cope, despite his upbringing. A thoughtful pause. Perhaps because of it any event you work to do here. The cane pointed at a closed door. There's where it happened. The rasp was back, implacable, ice-hard, vindictive. The old lady, moving painfully, stumped to the door, threw it open, turned on the light. Her blood's still there. I'm on the board, gave instructions, nothing to be disturbed. Annie edged reluctantly into the room. She couldn't avoid seeing the desktop and the darkish brown splotches on the scattered sheets of paper. The low-beamed ceiling and rough-hewn, unpainted board walls indicated an old lean-to room. No rugs graced the warped floorboards. An unadorned wooden chair sat behind the scarred and mixed desk. In one corner, a small metal typewriter table held a Remington, circa 1930. Gloved fingers gripped Annie's elbow like talons. The walking stick pointed across the room. Her chair. That's the way the police found it. Propelled by the vice-like grip, Annie crossed the few feet to the desk and stared at the chair. The very unremarkable oak chair. Old, yes. But so was everything in the room. Old, with a slat missing. The ivory stick kicked against the chair seat. No pillow. Constance always sat on a pillow. Bad hip. Never complained, of course. Now, you tell me, young miss, where's that pillow? Right at four o'clock and no pillow. Annie was so busy wondering if Miss Dora had finally gone around the bend, which would be no surprise to her, that was for sure, that it took her a moment to realize that she was young miss. Annie slanted a sideways glance. Miss Dora hunched over her stick now, her gloved hands tight on the knob. She stared at the empty chair, her lined face sorrowful. Sixty years I knew Constance, always doing good works. 
didn't simper around with a pious whine or a holier-than-thou manner. Came here every day, and every day the poor in Chestane came to her for help. No electricity. They came here. Husband beat you. Son stole your money. They came here. A sick child and no food. They came here. A tear edged down the ancient sallow cheek. I used to tell her, Constance, the world's full of sorrow. Always has been. Always will be. You're like the little Dutch boy at the dike. The old lady reached out a gloved hand and gently touched the straight chair. Then the reptilian eyes glittered at Annie. Know what Constance said? No. The dark little room and the blood-spattered desk held no echo of its former tenant. This was just a cold and dreary place touched by violence. Constance said, Why, Dora, love, it's so simple. I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Beyond the dry whisper was an echo of a light and musical voice. Miss Dora's stick cracked sharply against the wooden floor. She stared at Annie with dark and burning eyes. A woman, she rasped, hard as stone against stone, who saw her duty and did it. A woman who would never, the cane struck. Never, the cane struck. Never, the cane struck. Quit the course. Annie reached for the telephone, then yanked her hand back. Damn it, she dreaded making this call. Miss Dora had almost persuaded her yesterday afternoon. Indeed, Constance Bolton's life did argue against her death. Annie studied the picture Miss Dora had provided of a slender, white-haired woman in a navy silk dress. Constance Bolton looked serious, capable, and resourceful, a woman accustomed to facing problems and solving them. Her wide-set brown eyes were knowledgeable, but not cynical. Her mouth was firm, but not unpleasant. Stalwart, steady, thoughtful. Yes, she had obviously been all of these and more. Yet, Annie glanced down at the poorly reproduced copy of the autopsy report on Constance Maud Bolton, white, female, age 72. The answer seemed inescapable, however unpalatable to Constance Bolton's friends. Annie hated to destroy Miss Dora's faith. But facts were facts. She dialed in a rush. Here. Miss Dora, this is Annie. I'm at the store. Listen, I got a copy of the autopsy report on Miss Bolton. Annie took a deep breath. She was sick, Miss Dora. Dying. Bone cancer. She hadn't told many people what she knew. Her doctor said so. And there were powder burns on her hand. Gusts of polar wind could not have been colder than Miss Dora's initial silence. Then she growled, Doesn't matter, young miss. Get to work. Think. The receiver thudded with the same force as the cane had struck the floor in that dingy office. Never, never, never quit the course. Annie slammed down her own receiver and glared at the phone, then jumped as it rang again. Death on demand. The pillow, Miss Dora intoned. The pillow, young miss, the pillow. And the receiver banged again. Annie jumped to her feet and paced across the coffee area. Agatha, the bookstore's elegant and imperious black cat, watched with sleepy amber eyes. Damn it, Agatha, that old bat's going to drive me crazy. Agatha yawned. Unreasonable, ill-tempered, stubborn. Annie stopped at the coffee bar and reached for her mug. But not stupid, Agatha. As she drank the delicious French roast brew, Annie stroked Agatha's silky fur and thought about Miss Dora. Irascible, yes. Imperious, yes. Stupid, no. And about as sentimental as an alligator. So if she knows in the depth of her creaky bones that Constance Bolton wasn't a quitter, where does that leave us? It wasn't suicide. It had to be murder. How could it be? Powder burns on her right hand. Constance Bolton was right-handed. A contact wound, star-shaped to the right temple. Bone cancer. And the gun. Annie returned to her table and rifled through the police report. The gun had been identified by Miss Bolton's housekeeper, Sammy Calhoun. 
A thirty-two caliber revolver. It had belonged to Constance Bolton's late brother, Everett. It had, as long as Sammy worked there, lain in the bottom drawer of the walnut secretary in the library. She had seen the gun as recently as late last week. The fact that this gun had been brought from Miss Constance's home was another pointer to suicide. But if she had been murdered, the use of that gun sharply circumscribed the list of possible killers. It had to be someone with access to the bottom drawer of that walnut secretary. Suicide or murder? On the one hand, terminal illness, powder marks, a contact wound, a gun brought from home. On the other hand, Miss Dora's unyielding faith in her friend's character and a missing pillow. Annie sipped at her coffee. A pillow. There didn't seem to be any reason. She thumped the mug on the counter and clapped her hands. Of course, of course, it could only have been done with a pillow. And that explains why the murder had to occur at four o'clock when the caroline sounded. It wouldn't have been necessary to mask a single shot, but it was essential to mask two shots. Oh, my God, the old devil was smart as hell. Annie pictured the dingy room and Constance sitting behind the desk. A visitor, someone Constance knew well, surely, standing beside the desk. The movement would have been snake-quick, a hand yanking the pistol from a pocket, pressing it against her temple and firing. That would have been the moment demanding swiftness, agility. Then it would have been a simple matter, edging the pillow from beneath her, pressing her hand against the gun and firing into the pillow. That would assure the requisite powder residue on her hand. The stage then was set for suicide, and it remained only to slip away, taking the pillow and, once home, to wash with soap and water to remove the powder marks upon the killer's hand. Oh, yes, Annie could see it all, even hear the tiny click as the door closed, leaving death behind. But was there anything to this picture? Was this interpretation an illusion born of Miss Dora's grief or the work of a clever killer? Annie could hear the crackly voice and behind it the musical tones of a good woman. I was hungry. By God, nobody was going to get away with the murder of Constance Bolton, not if Annie could help it. Annie focused on Miss Constance's last few days. If it was murder, why now? Why on November 18? The housekeeper agreed that Miss Constance was sick. But she paid it. No, never mind. Miss Constance, she always kept on to keep it on. Even after Mr. Peter was killed in that car wreck up north, that broke her heart, but she never gave in. Howsome ever, she was dragged down last week. Thursday night, she hardly pecked at her supper. Annie made a mental note about Thursday. She compiled a list of Miss Constance's visitors at Helping Hands the past week. The visitors were all, to the volunteers, familiar names, familiar troubles, familiar sorrows. Except on Thursday. Portia Finley said energetically, We did have someone new late that afternoon. A young man, very thin. He looked ill. A Yankee. Wouldn't tell me what his trouble was. Said he had to talk to Miss Constance personally. He wrote out a note and asked me to take it into her. She read it and said she'd see him immediately. They were still in her office talking when I went home. It took all of Annie's tact, but she finally persuaded Portia Finley to admit she'd read that short note on lined notepad paper. I wanted to be sure it wasn't a threatening note, or obscene. Oh, by all means, Annie said encouragingly. It didn't amount to much, just said he was a friend of Peter's, and Peter had told him to come and see her. Father's volunteer, Cindy Axton, reluctantly had nothing out of the ordinary to report. But Saturday's volunteer, Emma Louise Rammert, had a sharp nose, inquisitive steel-gray eyes, and a suspicious mind. Don't believe it was suicide. They could show me a video of it, and I still wouldn't believe it. Oh, yes, I know she was sick, but she never spoke of it. Certainly that wouldn't be motive enough, not for Constance. But something upset her that morning, and I think it was the paper, the clarion. She was fine when she came in. Oh, serious enough. Looked somber, but not nervy. She went into her office. I came in just a moment later with the mail, and she was staring down at the front page of the clarion like it had bitten her. Besides, it seems a mighty odd coincidence that on the afternoon she was to die, she'd send me off early on what turned out to be a wild goose chase. 
supposed to be a woman with a sick child at the Happy Vale trailer court, and there wasn't anybody of that name. So I think Constance sent me off so she could talk to somebody without me hearing. Otherwise, I'd have been there at four o'clock, just closing up. Was the volunteer's absence engineered to make way for suicide or for an appointment? Constance Bolton, had she planned to die, easily could have waited until the volunteer left for the day. But if she wanted to talk to someone without being overheard, what better place than her office at closing time? Annie picked up a copy of the Saturday morning clarion and took it to the Sip and Sup coffee shop on Main Street. The lead story was about Arafat and another PLO peace offer. The town council had met to consider banning beer on the beach. Property owners attacked the newest beach nourishment tax proposals. Island merchants reported excellent holiday sales. A story in the bottom right column was headed, Autopsy Reveals Car Occupant Murder Victim. Buford County authorities announced today that a young man found in a burning car Thursday night, originally thought to have died in a one-car accident on a county road, was a victim of foul play. Despite extensive burns, the autopsy revealed, the young man had died as a result of strangulation. The victim was approximately 5 feet 7 inches tall, weighed 130 pounds, was Caucasian, and suffered from AIDS. The car was found by a passing motorist late Thursday evening on Kaloe Road, two miles south of the intersection with Jasper Road. The car was rented at the Savannah Airport on Thursday by a Richard Davis of New York City. Authorities are seeking information about Davis's activities in Chastain. Anyone with any information about him is urged to contact Sheriff Chadwick Porter. Annie called Miss Dora. Tell me about Peter. Constance's grandnephew. His father, Morgan, was the son of Everett, her older brother. Everett died about 20 years ago, not long after Morgan was killed in Vietnam. Peter inherited the plantations, but he never worked them. James did that, the other brother. But they went to Peter. The oldest son of the oldest son inherits in the Bolton family. Peter inherited from his mother, too. She was one of the Cinnamon Hill Morleys. Grieved herself into the grave when Morgan was killed in Vietnam. So Constance raised the boy and James ran the plantations. When he was grown, Peter went to New York. A photographer. Didn't come back much. Then he was killed last winter. A car wreck. One car wreck had masked murder. Had another? Annie wished for Max as she made one phone call after another, but she knew how to do it. When it became clear that Peter Bolton didn't die in a car wreck, despite that information in his obituary, which had been supplied by his great-uncle James, she redoubled her efforts. She found Peter's address, his telephone number, and the small magazine where his last photograph had been published, and talked to the managing editor. But Peter wasn't murdered. Peter died in a New York hospital of AIDS. And Richard Davis had been dying of AIDS before he was strangled and left in a burning car in Beaufort County, South Carolina. Richard's note to Constance Bolton claimed he was a friend of Peter's. More than a friend? Maggie Sutton had the apartment above Richard's in an old Brooklyn brownstone. Her voice on the telephone was clipped and unfriendly. You want to know anything about Richard Davis, you ask. Before she could hang up, destroy Annie's link to Richard, and threw him to Peter, Annie interrupted quickly. Richard's dead, murdered. Please talk to me. I want to find his murderer. It took a lot of explaining. Then Maggie Sutton said simply, My God, poor Richie. Did you know Richard was coming to South Carolina? Yes, he was sick. I know. And they fired him. They aren't supposed to do that, but they did it anyway. Before most people with AIDS can appeal, file a lawsuit, they're dead. Richie was almost out of money. His insurance was gone. They only want to insure healthy people, you know. Nobody with real health problems can get insurance. Richie and Peter lived downstairs from me. Nice guys. She paused, repeated forcefully. Nice guys. A sigh. Oh, 
God, it's all so grim. Richie took care of Peter. He died last winter. Last week, Richie told me he was going on a trip, and he asked me to feed their cat, Big Boy, while he was gone. Richie said Peter had written a will before he died, leaving everything to Richie, but he didn't do anything about it then. I mean, he didn't want Peter's money. But now he was desperate, and he thought maybe if he went down there, showed the will to the family. Her voice trailed off. The family. The last surviving member of the family stood with his head bowed, his freshly shaved face impassive, his hands clasped loosely behind his back, as mourners dispersed at the conclusion of the graveside service on Tuesday afternoon. A dark-suited employee of the funeral home held a black umbrella to shield James Caldwell Bolton from the rain. The day and James Bolton were a study in greys. The metallic grey Constance Bolton's casket, resting over the dark pit of her grave. The steel grey of Bolton's pinstripe suit. The soft grey of weathered stones. The misty grey of the weeping sky. The silver grey of Miss Dora's rain cape. The flinty grey of the stubby palmetto's bark. The ash grey of the rector's grizzled hair. Annie huddled beneath the outspread limbs of a live oak. A thick wool scarf knotted at her throat, her raincoat collar upturned. Rain splashed softly against gravestones as mourners came forth to shake Bolton's hand and murmur condolences. Annie stared at the man who had inherited the Bolton and Morley family plantations. James Bolton didn't look like a murderer. He looked, as indeed he was, like a substantial and respectable and wealthy member of the community. There was a resemblance to his dead sister, brown eyes, white hair, a firm cheek, but where Constance's face was memorable for its calm pity and gentle concern, there was an intolerant and arrogant quality to his stolid burger's face. As the last of Miss Constance's friends trod away across the spongy ground of the graveyard, Annie left the oyster shell path. Skirting behind a stand of pines, she moved into the oldest part of the cemetery, stopping in the shadow of a crumbling mausoleum some twenty-five yards distant from the new gravesite. Bolton waved away the undertaker with the umbrella. Had any of the mourners looked back, they would have glimpsed his figure, head again bowed, lingering for a last moment with his sister. But Annie could see his face. It was for a singular, heart-stopping instant transformed. His lips curved up in satisfaction. Annie knew, as clearly as if he'd shouted, that James Bolton was exulting. A murderer twice over, safe, secure, successful. A rich and powerful man. James! His face reformed into sad repose as he turned toward Miss Dora. The old lady took her time, each step obviously a painful task. Annie slipped free of her raincoat, unfurled a navy umbrella. Sammy Calhoun had quite willingly given her mistress's umbrella to Miss Dora, and undid the scarf covering the curly white wig. Miss Dora, her wizened face contorted in a worried frown, peered up at James Bolton. James, I've had the oddest, the raspy voice wavered. Communication. The Ouija board, last night. Never been a believer in that sort. James. Annie held a high, light, musical tone, then let her voice waver and drop like the sigh of a winter wind. In her own ears, it didn't sound enough like the recorded interview the local radio station had found of Constance Bolton speaking out in a League of Women Voters forum on abortion. She tried again, a little louder. James! It must have been better than she thought. James Bolton's head whipped around, seeking out the sound. His face was suddenly gray, too, the color of old putty. Annie glided from behind the cover of the mausoleum, one hand outstretched. James! Then she backed away, just as a dimly seen figure might drift forth, then disappear. Once out of Bolton's sight, she darted in a crouch from stone to stone until she gained the street. 
Quickly pulling on the scarf and raincoat, she hurried to Miss Doris. <laughs> Miss Doris, satisfied cackle would chill the devil. She poured a cup of steaming tea. Annie sneezed. The heat against her fingers helped a little, but she didn't feel that her bones would ever warm from the graveyard cold. Miss Dora glowered. No time to flag. Young people today, too puny. I'm fine, Annie retorted crisply and knew she was catching a cold. But she couldn't afford to sneeze tonight. She and Miss Dora weren't finished with James Bolton. Scared him to death, Miss Dora gloated. He looked like bleached bones. Her raisin dark eyes glittered. Mouth open, whites of his eyes big as a platter. And when I pretended I hadn't seen or heard a thing, thought he was going to faint. That's when I told him about the Ouija message. Pillow, find pillow. <laughs> she cackled again. Annie took a big gulp of tea and voiced her concern. Miss Dora, how can we be sure he didn't destroy the pillow? Miss Dora's disdainful look infuriated Annie. Classical education taught people how to think, the old lady muttered. Crystal clear, young miss. He dared not leave it behind. He had to take it with him. Then what? He couldn't keep it in his house. Old Beulah Willens, his housekeeper. Not a single spot safe from her eyes. So, not hidden in his house. No incinerators permitted in the city. Besides, it's too bulky to burn well. Joe Bill Tompkins drives James. So, not in his car. I talked here and there. He's not been out to any of the plantations since Constance died. So where is it? Somewhere not too far, young miss. Another malicious cackle. <laughs> James thinks he's so smart. We'll see, won't we? The rain had eased to a drizzle. Annie was warm enough. A black wool cap. Thermal underwear, a rainproof jacket over a wool sweater, rainproof pants, sturdy black Reeboks. The nylon hose over her face made it hard to breathe, but it sure kept her toasty. From her vantage point, she could see both the front and rear doors to James Bolton's house. She had taken up her station at 9.30. Miss Dora was to make her phone call at 9.35 and play the recording Annie had made and remade until Annie's whispered, James, I'm coming for the pillow. Sounded sufficiently like Constance Bolton to satisfy Miss Dora. The back door opened at 9.40. James Bolton, too, was dressed for night in dark clothing. He paused on the top step and looked fearfully around, then hurried to the garage. Annie smiled grimly. He reappeared in only a moment, carrying a spade. Annie followed him across the Bolton property and through a dank and dripping wood. She stepped softly along the path, keeping his shaded flashlight in view, stopping when he stopped, moving when he moved. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Annie's heart somersaulted and she gasped for breath. Bolton cowered by a live oak. Annie wasn't sure which one of them the owl had frightened the most. Iron hinges squealed, and Bolton stepped through the opened gate to the old graveyard, leaving the gate ajar. He moved more cautiously now, and the beam from his flashlight poked jerkily into shadowy pockets. Did he fear that his dead sister awaited him? Annie tiptoed, scarcely daring to breathe. One hand slipped into her jacket pocket and closed around the sausage-thick canister of mace, a relic of the days when she lived in New York. The other hand touched the lacquer that hung from a strap around her neck. Bolton stopped twice to listen. Annie crouched behind gravestones and waited. When he reached the oldest section of the cemetery, he moved more boldly, confident now that he was unobserved. He walked directly to a winged angel atop a marble pedestal, stepped five paces to his right, and used the shovel to sweep away a mound of leaves. Annie was willing to bet the earth beneath those leaves had been recently loosened. He shoveled quickly, but placing the heaps of moist, sandy dirt in a neat pile to one side. Annie crept closer and closer, the lyca in hand. She was not more than ten feet away and ready when he reached down and lifted up a soggy, newspaper-wrapped oblong. The flash illuminated the graveyard with its brief, brilliant light, capturing forever and always the stricken face of James Bolton. He made a noise deep in his throat. 
Wielding the shovel, he lunged blindly toward the source of light. Annie danced sideways to evade him. Now the canister of mace came out, and as he flailed the shovel and it crashed against a gravestone, Annie pressed the trigger and mace spewed in a noisome mist. Annie held her breath, darted close enough to grab up the sodden oblong where he had dropped it, paused just long enough, she couldn't resist it, to moan, James. Then she ran faster than she'd ever imagined in a 10K, leaping graves like a fox over water hazards. The headline in next morning's clarion told it all. James Bolton charged in murder of sister. Miss Dora rattled the newspaper with satisfaction, then poured Annie another cup of coffee. The old lady's raisin dark eyes glittered. We showed him, didn't we? Saved Constance's good name. For once, and it was such an odd feeling, Annie felt total rapport with the ill-tempered, opinionated, impossible creature awaiting her answer. Annie grinned. Miss Dora, we sure as hell did. Annie bought her own copy of the newspaper before she took the ferry back to the island. She wanted to have it to show to Max, especially since his telegram had arrived last night. Retrieval accomplished. No fireworks. Boring, actually. Only action caused by fleas Laurel picked up in jail. Plus Teresa tummy. Me. Home soon, but not soon enough. Love, Max. A Good Name by Carolyn Hart is taken from the book A Woman's Eye, edited by Sarah Paretsky, narration by Laurie Holt, music by Craig Harris, all rights reserved.